Okay, uh, good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome to this evening's um, seminar in the uh, Sir Michael Howard New Directions in the History of War and Violence series. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Dr. Mark Condos. I'm the convener of the series and one of the co-directors of the Sir Michael Howard Center. Um, and this evening is my great pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Martin Thomas um, from Exeter, um, who uh, is going to be giving a paper tonight. So um, Professor Thomas's pre previous research uh, has examined uh, a wide range of topics, including colonial policing, intelligence, and violence across different European empires with, a, I, I guess, a, a particular focus on the French Empire and also British Empire as well. Um, he's the author of numerous books, uh, including Empires of Intelligence, Security Services, and Colonial Disorder, um, one of my personal favorites of your, of your work, uh, Martin. Uh, he's also an author of Violence and Colonial Order, uh, Police Workers and Protest in European Colonial Empires, uh, and Fight or Flight, Britain, France, and Their Roads to Empire, or From Empire. He's also co-author alongside Richard Toy of Arguing About Empire, Imperial Rhetoric in Britain and France, 1882 to 1956. Uh, as I understand it, his current research examines the meanings and impacts of colonial disintegration uh, and decolonization, um, during the sort of mid uh, 20th century. And this evening, um, Professor Thomas is going to be sharing a paper with us entitled After the War Was Over, Franco-Algerian Security Cooperation in the 1960s. So Martin, please do take it away. Thanks very much, Mark. And thanks again, everybody, for coming this evening. Um, I'm really, really pleased to be able to talk with you about this. Uh, I was saying to Mark as we were chatting earlier on that this is really an attempt to bring together a lot of material that I've had for quite a long time from Algiers and Paris, but which, I, to be honest, I haven't quite known what to do with. So do please tell me if you think there's a lack of coherence here or, or anything else, because uh, I'm trying to perhaps bolt together things that um, um, might look a little disparate. But um, the starting point really is the disjuncture, I suppose, between what looks to be happening in Algeria at the point of nominal independence in 1962 and what seems to be happening behind the scenes. We know, for example, that um, France's violent exit uh, is often taken, I suppose, as a kind of quintessential climactic decolonization. Um, one in which a war is fought to its bitter end, one in which settlers are substantially forced to leave or choose to leave um, at the immediate point of uh, independence, and one in which there is a really violent last ditch uh, reaction against the prospect of independence. And that reaction, of course, is typified by the Organisation d'Armée Secrète, the OAS, um, and uh, its kind of campaign of bombing, not only in Algeria, but also in mainland France. On the Algerian side, we know too that the uh, FLN, the Front de Libération Nationale Régime that's about to take office, um, seems to be pretty intolerant of those who find themselves on the wrong side of history, as it were. Um, there's going to be quite a, a spring and summer of bloodletting, all of which is very much studied and very much well known, and all of which seems to underline the idea that Algerian independence marks a rupture, a total break with France, a new beginning, um, a, an affirmation, if you like, that the new Algeria is going to be the beacon of third worldism, what, of course, Geoffrey Byrne in a brilliant book calls the Mecca of Revolution. Well, I don't really disagree with any of that, but I suppose what I'm going to be doing this evening is presenting, I hope, quite a lot of evidence that suggests a rather different picture. Because behind the scenes, and this is where the second image can perhaps go up, um, neither the settler exodus nor the kind of image of a young Algeria uh, riding the crest of a revolutionary, ray, uh, re revolutionary rave, perhaps, but certainly a wave. Um, neither of those things quite sit with the speed with which Algerians and French 
in government begin working together once again. Put differently then, the upheavals of the war's violent outcome have obscured the security connections that are very swiftly re-established and arguably actually never totally broken between the French authorities and the security forces of the now independent Algerian Republic. And what I'm gonna do with this paper, which is substantially based, as I said, on material from Algiers and also from something called the Service de Liaison avec l'Algérie, which is a, a kind of back office operation within a back office operation within the political affairs directorate, which works inside the French foreign ministry. It's not a very well known um, uh, bureaucratic uh, office and it's never been in the limelight. Its papers, I think, are pretty much sort of left untouched, but it's in those that um, I found quite a lot of what I think is, is rather revelatory material. Those papers and others within the Algiers uh, government records of um, the early phase, the first phase of a reorganized Algerian foreign ministry, they suggest that um, both the French government under Charles de Gaulle, of course, the Fifth Republic, and uh, Ahmed Ben Bella's new FLN regime were quite eager to build bridges between one another. That, of course, is taking place against perhaps a better known story, which is the increasing factionalization within the infant Algerian Republic. And that factionalization, I suppose, has been personified, at least in popular histories and perhaps in popular memory, by the rivalry between the president, Ahmed Ben Bella, and his defense minister, Huari Boumediene. And you can see those in the next PowerPoint slide. Ben Bella, as perhaps that picture suggests, the sort of revolutionary darling of the third worldist left, uh, a man of multiple international and transnational connections, very much different to his defense minister there in his Chinese fatigues, Huari Boumedien, who had avoided, unlike Ben Bella, who had avoided capture during the Algerian war, but had done so substantially by working from across the frontier within Morocco, as we will see. Um, and that different war history, those different trajectories, Ben Bella as perhaps Algeria's foremost political prisoner, uh, Boumedien as a kind of external military leader, were absolutely crucial to what I'm going to relay and to what happened next. Better known, of course, is that Boumediene would actually overthrow Ben Bella in mid-June 1965 on the eve of what was supposed to be the second Bandung conference, a conference that had been rescheduled for Algiers. Um, and indeed people, it is said, mistook the coup for kind of a last minute dress rehearsal for that second Bandung. And of course it was a second Bandung that was never to take place. The regime was not just um, divided between those two leaders, but um, much more deeply uh, further down. Makizao, former fighters, in other words, in two of the regional centers of um, FLN operations, Wilayas three and four, that is the sort of central highlands, the Berber highlands of Kabylia and the Eastern Algerian region of Constantine. Both of those would rebel against the hijacking, so they said by the FLN of um, a sort of true revolutionary path um, by a kind of narrow-minded socialist and very highly Arabized um, statism. And they would be joined in that by members of the uh, Socialist Forces Front, the FSS, which I can pop the next PowerPoint up if you like. Um, that was an organization grouped around one of the original nine founders of the FLN, Hossein Eit Ahmed, who it is sort of commonly said in, in kind of um, Algerian popular history was the true inheritor of the FLN's Fanonian tradition of kind of people's revolution. 
and the FFS and Ahmed, uh, Eight Ahmed would lead a rebellion in 1964 against what they described as the, the regime's sort of high degree of centralization, its overbearing Arabization, and its creeping authoritarianism. All of those regime opponents would face um, sanction, imprisonment, some, some uh, would be murdered during the course of 1963 and 1964. And that repression would sort of catalyze the growth of what would become the, the uh, new Armée Nationale Populaire. I'm not going to bombard you, I hope, with acronyms, but uh, this is one of them, the ANP, the Armée Nationale Populaire. That is independent Algeria's military uh, security forces, inheritors, in other words, of what had been the FLN, the independence movement's armed wing, which is the last of the acronyms, was called the ALN, the Armée de Libération Nationale. And you can put the fifth PowerPoint up there, please. Now, in theory, the new ANP, the new Algerian National Army, was consistent with Frantz Fanon's famous injunction to the FLN to foster Algerian national consciousness among a people whose capacity to express their authentic cultural identity had been so restricted by decades of really deep French colonialism. The title of the ANP is significant. It was an Armée Nationale Populaire. It was supposed to be a people's army, much like its um, Chinese uh, antecedent on which in theory it would supposedly be based. So it would become an organization with political commissars, it was supposed to have a very flat hierarchy, it was supposed in other words to be the antithesis of the French security forces that its predecessor, the ALN, the Armée de Libération Nationale, had been at war with. Well that was the theory. In practice though the ANP became the reservoir of authoritarian power in a regime that while outwardly anti-colonialist would cleave to multiple external partners to assure its survival. But it was only after Ben Bella's overthrow by Boumediene in June 65 that a much more permissive security environment was created for the kind of um, deep-seated and deep state I would argue, security partnerships that I'll be describing. Former chief of staff of the ALN and leader of the movement's military forces in Morocco, as I said, Boumediene's influence would rest on the security networks he built around him within this new military, within the ANP. And these would grow in aggregate power and repressive capabilities in the years after independence all, I would suggest, at variance with what Ben Bella, Boumediene's rival, had claimed to want for the new Algerian Republic, and at variance, it seems, with what an awful lot of Algerians wanted as well. So what's the point of all this? What are, what's the point of my paper? What am I trying to say? Well, there are a few things, really. One, did the predominance of covert warfare in the final years of colonial Algeria, the years, in other words, of the dirtiest phase of the Algerian war, paradoxically make possible easy security cooperation after the war was over. And I'll explain that paradox a bit more as I go along. If that's the case, what, if anything, did decolonization signify in the early development of Algeria's deep security state? Was this a real decolonization? It's held up, as I said earlier on, as the kind of emblematic one, arguably, in the history of all decolonizations. But clearly something else is going on behind the scenes. And I'd further suggest that matters of intelligence culture are absolutely pivotal to finding some sort of answer to those questions. They're also significant in unraveling the paradox behind them. In other words, the enmity of contested decolonization, which, as I suggested just, just now, is critical to the consolidation of security exchanges between former enemies, 
who prided themselves on knowing one another's hidden objectives. In other words, just as supposedly there aren't any secrets between friends, in the case of France, France and Algeria in 1962 to about 68, 69, there don't seem to be that many secrets between enemies. Neither the politics of secrecy nor the practices needed to facilitate them disappeared with Algerian independence. Indeed, security cooperation between France and Algeria rested on a shared understanding that the creation of policing agencies and the securitization of the new regime would go hand in hand. Why? Well, before independence, the FLN's political program had fluctuated between a kind of secular and broadly pan-Arabist socialism and strains of much more distinctly Algerian nationalism that wedded a moderate Islamism to the modernizing ideals of liberationist anti-colonialism. Now, none of that surprised those who were observing the war or who were fighting the war. Um, those sort of conflicting tendencies, if you like, between a kind of Nasserite Algeria to, to sort of stereotype it a bit, and a rather more authentically Islamic and Algerian Algeria uh, were at the heart of those rivalries and those early phases of repression I mentioned just now. Indeed, far from diminishing as the FLN took power, the tensions intrinsic to those alternate visions of how to govern, for what purpose and for whom, only became more intense. Next slide, please. Differing constructions of Algeria's post-independent future divided then along lines of ideology, cultural orientation, ethnic attachment, and gender inclusion. An argument over those issues mirrored the cleavages between a nationalist movement, uh, within a nationalist movement, I should say, whose internal divisions had widened the closer it came to winning. As a result, the FLN, although it definitely won, immediately fractured in 1962. At the high political level of, I've discussed already, the most obvious split was between rivals inside the provisional government, grouped around either Ben Bella or Boumed Yen. But this executive level split had much wider permutations. Some were grounded in regional connection, Eight Ahmed's Socialist Forces Front, for example, others in war experience, those who remained in, inside Algeria throughout the conflict, those who'd either been imprisoned outside it or like Boumed Yen had remained across the frontier in Morocco for most of the conflict. Still others in disputes over strategy and international affiliation. Rivalry was also endemic between those, if you like, who um, worked within the FLN's civilian wing and those who cleaved to the old ALN. Some of the arguments between them were tactical and they reflected long running disagreements about the nature of the Algerian society to be built after decolonization. Some were ideological, which way should this country go? What was its ultimate purpose? How should the new Algeria be, be, be built? And a lot more of it was actually really instrumental. How could people's lives be improved after eight years of such a devastating war? How, in other words, were living standards to be addressed? The scale of the tasks facing the post-independent regime were huge. The OAS had sabotaged Algeria's infra industrial infrastructure systematically, uh, smashing plant equipment and bombing the country's electricity grid. At independence in July 62, the FLN estimated that only 20% of the country's factory capacity, capacity was functional. Farming, still my father majority occupation, had broken down in the war's final years with less, less than half of all cultivatable land in use. Unemployment was over 2 million in a population that was nudging 10. Millions more, between 2.5 and 3.4 to be precise, were internally displaced or living abroad as refugees. And so for Ben Bella, status direction in these circumstances was unavoidable. To him, it was also very much desirable 
an adjunct to Algeria's socialization. And that's where multiple offers of foreign financial aid and technical expertise came, came in. Because for those around Bembella, the obvious point was, well, why wait to begin the social societal transformation that we've been fighting for when we've got lots of suitors available who will enable us to get on with it? As I've said already, Ben Bella would of course be stopped in his tracks. But well before he was ousted in June 65, the FLN's divide shaped the ways in which Franco-Algerian security cooperation would develop. Seen from a French perspective, the provision of military equipment, training and technical advice were all means to promote the, the interests of favored regime insiders. In material terms, the initial priority was to equip internal security forces capable of imposing order in a post-colonial state, in which, as I've said, rebellions were a pressing danger. Very funny. In other words, um, the French did not want Algeria to descend into a civil war, which looked decidedly possible in 1963 and 64. Seen from the Algerian perspective, securing French aid conferred other advantages. Military cooperation confirmed the normalization of relations with an erstwhile enemy, and with it, a sort of diplomatic maturity, if you like, of the Alger Algerian state. It would certainly help legitimize it in the West. For senior figures in the Algerian military, the ANP, France was uniquely well-placed to provide much needed basic supplies, pistols, rifles, boots, clothing, all of which the uh, ANP didn't have in the summer of 1962, and which it claimed it desperately needed in order to, if you like, make governmentality a reality. Guns, in other words, were crucial to make the new regime's authority legible in those months immediately after independence. Away from the weapons and the violence, for the regime's technocrats, of which there were many, French advice was equally essential in multiple spheres. Expertise in engineering and management science would get factories working again, others built from the ground up. Medical provision would help re-equip hospitals, and provide training to local staff. Now, as we all know, friendly competitors like West Germany and the USA, as well as uh, France's rivals, more hostile rivals like China, the USSR, East Germany, Egypt and Cuba, were also adept at offering healthcare support, barefoot doctors, surgeons, medicines, mobile clinics, etc. But for the, Alger for the Algerian regime, Encouraging this marketplace of competing assistance made a lot of sense because it drove down the political costs attached to such provision. And the requirements of remedial health care um, in a war-torn nation lacking basic medical infrastructure far outstripped the totality of aid on offer. In other words, even if the Algerian government said yes to everybody offering to help, it still needed more. Closer to government, French civil servants, housing officers, auditors and accountants lent advice about basic bureaucratic procedures, particularly um, fiscal record keeping. The French, in other words, were absolutely fundamental to creating the taxation regime in independent Algeria, which arguably was the, the foundation of much else. That said, for all the sort of civilian appearance of these dimensions to aid, from construction engineers to doctors and administrators, it was Algerian army personnel who took the key decisions on what aid to accept and how much. Now, with that in mind, it was perhaps less surprising than you might imagine that the Algerian provisional government, the FL on authority that negotiated the independent settlement back in 1962, had taken steps towards working with the French even before the war ended. During the Evian talks that would end the war, provisional government negotiators had put out feelers about French help in organizing an Algerian gendarmerie, 
a paramilitary that it was thought would have to take up positions very quickly after independence in order to keep order. Um, in practice, that didn't happen. Instead, it was the ALN, the existing uh, guerrilla army under Boumedien, that policed the independence transition. And so it was under Boumedien that the violence of the spring and summer of 1962, the killing in particular of upwards of 30,000 um, Haki, former uh, auxiliaries who'd worked with the French security forces, uh, took place. Now, that too, one might think, would be a barrier to Franco-Algerian cooperation, and particularly cooperation with Boumedienne. But the first point to, to stress about these records that I'm drawing on is that there is absolute consensus that the Haki problem, as it's rather insultingly, uh, or rather callously described, uh, is not to get in the way of normalization of relations. And it's that, I think, that's behind the French decision, de Gaulle's decision in July 62, not to offer um, immigration passes to Aki and their families who are desperate to get out of the country. Meanwhile, um, Ben Bella, the president, of course, becomes rather more closely involved in matters. Aware that the ALN under Boumedienne had sort of taken the initial lead in working with the French, Ben Bella tries to reorient things over the autumn and winter of 1962, going back to that original Evian negotiation proposition that the French might be able to equip the Algerian police. After all, there's lots of French equipment hanging around in Algeria, uh, and much of it is due to be sort of packed up and sent home, which frankly, the French don't really want to be bothered with. So if they can uh, find a, a useful outlet for jeeps, small arms, clothing, equipment, uh, so much the better. By October of 62, that kind of arrangement has already been agreed. And uh, the French are simply allowing the Algerians effectively to enter their old garrisons and supply centers and take what equipment they want and what equipment they need. All of that is being supervised from within the Elysee Palace, within the presidential office in Paris, by three people. And that's the next PowerPoint, please, Mark. Um, Michel Debré, uh, de Gaulle's prime minister, his chef de cabinet, Constantine Melnik, who's also a senior security service official, and the Minister of State for Algerian Affairs, the man who'd taken the lead in negotiating, Evian Louis Jox. Um, they are happy for these sorts of relatively impromptu arrangements to uh, proceed, but what they emphasize is that there needs to be a much more comprehensive and ambitious uh, mutual assistance agreement made. And that is the sort of end objective in view for uh, de Gaulle's government by the end of 62. Meanwhile, Boumedienne, the defense minister, aware, if you like, and there's this sort of toing and froing emerging, I suppose, in what I'm describing, aware that Ben Bella had stolen a march in the gendarmerie equipment issue, um, steps back into the fray. In November, at a meeting, a sort of high profile dinner um, on the 9th, he says that he hopes the sort of the, the embarrassment, what he calls the atrocities committed by all sides in the recent war, to quote him, will soon be forgotten. And he talks about letting bygones be bygones and uses the phrase exchanging documentation between Algeria and France. Now, I kind of puzzled over that for a little while until um, I realized from some of the subsequent correspondence between him and uh, his French counterparts, what he was talking about. This was the first official step towards um, the creation of a covert security partnership, a sort of secret deal, if you like, to help entrench the ANP, the military regime that it was ultimately to become in power. Now, 
that Boumed Yen should raise the matter of intelligence sharing and security cooperation uh, was really no coincidence. He'd done uh, his, his time, if you like, as a senior FLN leader, very much on the cusp of its um, security apparatus. He created what would become the FLN's intelligence service, um, and he built up um, the, the outlines, if you like, of what would become after independence, the, the so-called Sécurité Militaire, the, um, uh, well, part paramilitary, but largely covert um, secret intelligence arm of the Algerian army. All of that had been done from within Morocco, and all of that had been done at the instigation of Boumed Yen and those around him in the so-called Ouja clan, uh, so named after the Algerian border town where they were based. Uh, other figures within that you might, that you might know, um, well, Abdelaziz Bouteflika, until recently Algeria's um, semi, semi uh, comatose president, of course, uh, who was foreign minister in Bembela's and then Boumed Yen's government, and also Ab Abdel Hafid Boussouf, who was arguably the, the sort of strongman figure in the Uj Ujda clan, who would really serve, if you like, as um, Boumed Yen's um, principal guide in the creation of what would become this kind of Algerian deep state. So first under Boussouf, in Morocco and then under Boumedien after independence in Algeria, the FLN had effectively become a state within a state. The movement had, as we know, levied lots of taxes, some legitimate, some illegitimate, uh, on not only Algerians, but on refugee communities across the Maghreb. And it had also begun a sort of quest to raise money through a, a host of um, business interests and security deals, very much akin, I think, to um, uh, what would be, um, become a fairly sort of widespread uh, apparatus of, of um, security service involvement in business that characterizes um, much of the sort of deep state regimes across some of um, the Arab world. Now, alongside these security activities, Boumed Yen devoted increasing resources to expanding a specific intelligence service, service this Sécurité Militaire, and he entrusted that, if we could have the next slide please, to um, a very young man called Kazdi Merba. Now, Kazdi Merba, along with Boussouf, who you can see on the left there, would arguably become the two pivotal figures in all of these security relationships with France that I'm describing. Boussouf, because he was the figure who uh, had Boumed Yen's ear and who basically drove the process of working with the French forward. Merba, because he um, very much directed the growth of the Sécurité Militaire. And the figure in the middle of that picture on the left there, Krimbel Kahim, was arguably the only serious rival to Boumed Yen after uh, the overthrow of Ben Bella in 65. Krim Belkachim, a former leader of Wilaya III, a former sort of um, FLN hero, if you like, one of the original nine founders of the movement. Um, but unfortunately for him, uh, an individual who launched a sort of, well, not a sort of, launched an assassination bid against Boumedien in 1967, which went wrong, then fled the country and would ultimately be strangled in a Frankfurt hotel room in 1970 on the instructions of Kazdi Merba. So there's, there's a power struggle still going on, suffice to say. Um, Boumedien, casting our minds and our paper back to uh, the immediate post-independence month and years, Boumed Yen was soon making really substantial requests to Paris. Um, by the end of 1962, he'd already asked for aircraft. He was starting to ask for tanks. Um, and he was also suggesting that the French should take a lead in providing military advisors. Now, that's very important because the, the kind of stock story, if you like, 
is that the Algerians cleave to two other sources of support entirely. One is the Soviet bloc, particularly the Soviets themselves, but also the Cubans, and the other is Nasser's Egypt. The problem with that characterization is twofold. On the one hand, as I'm sure you all know, Nasser's Egypt is on the brink of um, a disastrous war in Yemen, which will uh, eat up most of its available surplus equipment, if you like, material that it could have assisted the Algerians with. And the, um, the Egyptians basically write themselves out of the script by 1964. As for the Soviets, well, yes, the Soviets, as we'll see, are absolutely crucial, but perhaps less crucial than the customary story has told. Uh, and I'll try to explain why. One is that the Soviets um, were attractive to the Algerian regime as aid providers because they tended to make no strings or attached arrangements, or so it seemed. In other words, they did not um, make offers of uh, military and technical support conditional on either repayment, loans, or on um, political exchanges or political dependency. Now, you might find that surprising, um, but the reason for that is quite simple. Uh, the USSR is much keener at the time in its sort of development and aid provision on barter arrangements, on securing raw materials, primary goods that can assist with um, uh, ongoing industrialization and food provision schemes. Secondly, uh, Khrushchev's regime is um, very keen to, if you like, supplant the um, Mao's China as the sort of expert in agricultural transformation, in, in land reform, peasant socialism, if you like. And for all of those reasons, it makes its uh, aid support effectively very cheap to take up. To be specific, in 1964, Moscow offers a cheap line of credit to the Algerian government which no other aid provider can match because it effectively defers all repayments indefinitely. So to put it bluntly, um, Algeria is offered substantially Soviet uh, military and commercial aid more or less for free, or so it seems. Now we all know that that's a rather naive position um, and that it's unlikely to have been quite like that. Certainly the Algerian regime does not look upon this supposedly uh, cheap or quasi free Soviet support as risk free, anything but. Um, one reason for that is that the Algerian regime at the time is still primarily exporting two things, wine, which of course is uh, a French in um, colonial introduction to Algeria, but more significantly, of course, hydrocarbons, particularly natural gas. Now, both of those, and more particularly hydrocarbons over time, will become immense sources of wealth through the Algerian regime. But on the other hand, uh, with them comes the risk of economic dependency. This, of course, is the era of neocolonialism. Kwame Nkrumah, Walter Rodney, others are writing fervently about the risks of newly independent post-colonial uh, countries falling under the remit of uh, a globalization that's either going to be Western dominated or uh, a sort of red globalism, if you like, that will be no less um, restrictive in its political implications. So how did the French react to that? Well, if we could have the next PowerPoint, uh, we can get one clue. What alarms them most is this place, which is the Frunz Military Academy. I'm sure I'm pronouncing that wrong, by the way, my apologies, uh, in Moscow. That's where um, Boumediene begins to send Algerian officer trainees of the ANP in 1963 and 1964. 
Now, the French are terrified by that because they see it, perhaps rightly, as evidence that, if you like, the USSR is getting in at the ground floor of the, the sort of state building of this authoritarian and highly militarized ANP-led regime. And so it's for that reason that the French effectively open up their own training academies, their own uh, universities indeed, to Algerian officers and students more generally. If they're to countermand Soviet influence, they are certain, that's Debré, Melnik, Jox, de Gaulle and others, that they have to act very, very quickly. And so one, one sort of piece of evidence that suggests that they're doing so is that um, they invest immediately in two things. One, an Algerian gendarmerie college and the other, an Algerian military academy in Algiers itself. Both are backed by French money and both will be staffed by French personnel. Just as crucially, the uh, French security service personnel who were involved in those early phases of military liaison equipment provision and training begin to suggest that if you like the the brakes can be taken off in the provision of equipment whereas previously uh, french support had been largely confined to those um, sort of low level supplies to algeria's police agencies and the French state had been very reluctant to meet Boumier Dien's first request for tanks, for heavy equipment, etc. By 1964, much more widespread arrangements are agreed. Um, and they're agreed with two big French arms makers, the Société Pénard, which later becomes a, an affiliate of Citroën, and the Société Industrielle et Mécanique de Carrosserie, which is better known as Simca. Both of those begin to supply heavy equipment to the Algerian ANP. Meanwhile, the French army begins what will become a long-term pattern of selling off its surplus um, uh, small arms to the Algerian army. Uh, in other words, uh, sort of material that is being replaced automatically begins to get fed towards Algeria. Now, I could go into much more detail of that, about that, but I'm conscious of time, so I'm going to skip a little bit ahead to um, two things. One is another extraneous event to all of this, which is, if we could have the next slide, please, the defeat of Algeria by Morocco in the so-called Sands War of November 1963. Now, some would say that's actually rather more of a skirmish than a war, but it's fought around Tindouf in the southwestern Algeria, uh, southwestern Sahara, sorry. Um, and Morocco, as a result, basically seizes a finger of territory in southwestern Algeria. Um, which abuts what had been Spanish Morocco. And this is the origins of Algeria's ongoing support for Polisario and for Western Saharan independence. Um, it's quite an important regional conflict in its own sort of strategic dimensions, but it also absolutely transforms the Algerian regime's attitude towards foreign um, military equipment, and in particular French military support. The second big development is, of course, as we move a little bit ahead, the continuing consolidation of Boumed Yen's position as defense minister and as head of the ANP, the, the National Army, and his use of that, those platforms to begin plotting uh, Ben Bella's overthrow. The upshot, as we know, is the 1965 coup, by which time, um, cooperation with the French has already moved on to uh, a kind of systemic level, if you like, at which it is utterly regularized. And I'm moving towards my conclusion here, because the clearest evidence I would suggest of that, if we have a look at the next slide, comes in the training of the next generation of 
the ANP's officer corps. Now, um, by 1966, Boumed Yen, by this time, of course, president, has decided that this is an officer corps that is going to be formed, trained, and uh, really shaped within the French military academy. And by the autumn of 1966, over 10,000 intending Algerian uh, army officers are being sent to various French military academies each academic year. And that will continue on into the early 1970s. Now that I would suggest is far more significant than the levels of sort of material aid that are coming into Algeria still from multiple sources, from the Russians, from the Cubans, a little bit from the Egyptians, from the Chinese and from others. It's the ANP, the people in other words, who are going to be the next generation of this kind of Algerian deep state who are so critical and whom I think the French realize are really their, their kind of um, ace in the hole, if you like, their absolute critical advantage. Um, proof of that? Well, I suppose proof, and this really is where I will conclude, comes in October 1967. Because in October 67, not only does that individual whom I mentioned earlier, Belkakem Krim, try to overthrow and murder Boumed Yen, but one of the reasons he does so in October 67 is because news slips out that Boumed Yen has actually asked the French if um, they will assist him in creating uh, an intelligence service modeled on that of France, modeled on the, the SDEC, the Service de Documentation Extérieure. And that is a, an offer that the French find far too good to refuse. And so from the autumn of 1967 onwards, France takes the leading role in training, not only uh, the Algerian overseas intelligence service, but members of Kasdi Merda's uh, Sécurité Militaire. In other words, what I'm suggesting is that within a couple of years of Boumed Yen's overthrow of Ben Bella in 65, France has become wholly complicit in creating a new kind of Algerian deep state and one that will remain in power in Algeria in various guises to this very day. Thanks very much for listening.